Good morning, and welcome to St. Paul, United Church of Christ, Keokuk. Our first scripture reading from the Old Testament comes from, from Psalm 83. 82, sorry. God presides in the great assembly. He gives judgment among the gods. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the cause of the weak and fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. But you will die like mere men. You will fall like every other ruler. Rise up, O God. Judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. Our New Testament reading, Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Coloss. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. The faith and love this spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel, that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience in joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Today, on this day, as we come before God, we acknowledge before God in our confession of sin that uh, we have done possibly a few things wrong. But one central thing sometimes escapes us. It sometimes escapes us because we kind of focus on those things that We might have done wrong, one or two here and there, and that sort of thing. What kind of escapes us is that uh, we we tend to choose things that are just the opposite of what we should be choosing. Now, the Apostle Paul was well aware of this, and he talked about it. He talked about how he was despairing because it it looked like he was always going in the wrong direction. And he said, finally, in despair, he said, thank God for Jesus Christ, who empowers me to live a new life. Because I'm helpless, otherwise, I tend to go in the wrong direction. It reminds me very much of my Malamute named Bear. That dog will go in the wrong direction every single time. I'll get ready to take it outside and I'll say, leave that cat alone, bear. That's none of your business what that cat is doing, but he has to stick his nose into it. Okay, get out of the garbage, bear, because there's nothing in there that I want you messing around with. You know, we have something in mind here. We're supposed to be going outside, but he has to investigate every single other thing before we go outside, going in exactly the opposite direction to the direction that I would like him to go in. And since sin came into the world, we have a tendency to go in the opposite direction to that in which God wants us to go because that's the way sin affects us. We have a tendency to go in the opposite direction. That's why God is always calling us back. 
That's why we attend church on a weekly basis, so that we can be called back, because we all experience that kind of weakness, that kind of moving in the wrong direction when we should be moving in the right direction. We've all experienced it. We all kind of know what that means, because we have things we should be doing, such as going on a diet, but you know that filled donut right now looks particularly good and for just this one time and all that sort of thing we're going to move in the wrong direction we have that not because we're particularly bad but because of the way sin operates within us we'll tend to move in the direction that god does not want us to move in and as a result of that we end up going in the direction that we shouldn't be going into. And the world, the people in the world do that too, but they don't know why they do it. They don't know why we do it. But we saw a tragic instance of that this week when all of those officers were targeted because someone was going in the wrong direction. The answer to violence is not more violence. It's not starting a war. Most generals, in fact, don't even want to start a war. When a war is suggested, they say, no, no, let's let's hold off. Unless the threat is imminent. See, we're going in the exact wrong direction, but the world, the people who are doing that, don't know why they're doing it. And that's because they're going in the direction opposite to which God would have us go. They're going in a direction completely opposite to that in which God would have us go. And that is the way sin works in the world. It makes things happen opposite to what we want. I once watched a television show in which uh, apparently the devil was after somebody's soul in that television show. And the way they tested that the devil was present was they buttered a piece of bread and they put uh, peanut butter on top of it. And then they dropped it, and if it dropped flat on the floor with peanut butter down, that indicated the devil was around because things went opposite of what they should really be ha- what sh- should really be happening. You know, if it lands peanut butter up, then you just dust it off. As long as it hasn't there for five minutes or so, then it's still good. <clears throat> That's an example of things going opposite. to uh, to the way in which they should be going. That's why the church is here. That's why we offer our witness. That's why we indicate that to be powerful, we have to recognize that weakness and we have to go in the exact opposite direction of what our natural tendency is. In other words, we have to move toward God. We have to move toward God. And in doing so then, we find that we are moving toward the light because we have a tendency to move toward the darkness because of sin, you see. All of us share in it. All of us share in it. We look at the evil out in the world and we say, oh, isn't that terrible? But we forget to look at the way in which we share in sin and we go in the opposite direction that we should be going into also. We should be trusting in God. We don't trust in God enough. We should be moving in the direction that God tells us to in terms of mission. We don't do that enough. Sometimes we back off and we say, well, we don't have enough resources and that sort of thing. But you know what? It's never a matter of resources. It's always a matter of commitment. That's what gives us strength is the commitment. The world says that you need to have the resources first. We say that you need to have the commitment first and then you'll find a way. I always like to uh, read survival stories of people who were in concentration camps or people who were in uh, prisoner of war camps in Japan and other places. They didn't survive because of the resources that were available to them. They didn't survive because they had great power over their captors. They didn't survive because they could go in with thousands of men and overcome whatever was imprisoning them. The first, th- the first way that they survived was in their head. When they had the commitment to survive. 
You ask any survivor of the camps, well, how did people survive? Well, the way they survived was by the firm resolve that they were going to survive. And often, most often, that was connected to faith as well. There was no reason in the world that they should have been able to survive, but they did. Same thing when people are out in the wilderness and in places like that. The resolve to survive always precedes the resources that you have. That's your strength, what's in your head. And your faith in your head is the greatest, most powerful thing in the world. But often the world says, look, the world says you have to have plenty of money in order to be powerful. You have to follow the ways of the world in in order to be powerful. You have to give up when it looks like things are tough. And what God says is, you turn to me. You don't give up. You put your head in the right place and you'll go in the right direction. You rely on my strength to help you go in the right direction. The Bible is full of sayings about Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Help the ways in which I doubt, and we doubt every day. But the greatest strength in the world is, and the greatest power is in your head, the way you think, the way you believe. That's where it is. And that's why you have this marriage here lasting so many years, you know, uh, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Again, that kind of commitment is admired. It's admired. It's the way you think that's previous to anything. That gives you your strength and power. Now we have a tendency, and we have to keep this in mind, and God keeps calling us back from this, We have a tendency to think on the dark side, don't we? We have a tendency to raise all sorts of issues. We have a tendency to say, well, this is never going to work. Have you ever heard that? And you know what happens? It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because it erodes the commitment. Now, we have a tendency to move in that direction, and God keeps calling us back from that and says, I will guide you, trust me, Do my mission in the world and things are going to work out. Come and follow me and do what I call you to do in the Great Commission and things are going to work out fine. Now I've studied a lot of churches that are very, they have a lot of people coming to them recently. And there was one concept that kind of interested me and that is the concept of discipling. One church had the concept of discipling. And basically, it wasn't very complicated. I expected all sorts of complicated things. But it wasn't very complicated. The basic idea was that one day, about ten people in the church got together and said, you know, I think we should disciple other people. Small, small church. I think we should disciple other people. I think we should go out each one of us, and ask other people, you know, to to be disciples, to come in. And from that point onward, because of that resolve, the church grew into greater and greater numbers. And in the early church, it was the same thing. You had uh, about, you know, you had a few disciples. What did they do? They discipled other people. And here you are sitting here today. You know, isn't that something? You're part of that discipling process. It's the resolve before anything else. The world says give up. The world says give up. It says, uh, it would say to Jesus, and it would say to the disciples, look, your leader was crucified, you're scattered. Even some, of your, even some of your strongest disciples denied Jesus three times. Who are you kidding? Give up. You know? 
But why are you sitting here? Why are you sitting here today? You're sitting here today because of that discipling process. And it continued years and years and thousands of years after, after Jesus was crucified and looked like it was all done. That was by the power of God. And the world would say, you know, that once Jesus was crucified, well, that's, you know, but, and, and the Christians suffered terrible persecutions as well. They were tortured. There were all sorts of things that said, no, no, this, this can't possibly work. In the second century after Christ, the pagans were saying, they were making fun of the Christians. They were saying, they have no long history. This is not going to last. This is just a flash in the pan. But you're here by that power. You're here by that power. The people of faith endure because that is the power. That's the real power. The wisdom of the world says you have to have all sorts of military might and all that sort of thing. But what you actually find even there is when it comes down to people actually prevailing, and my father found this in World War II, what you actually find is that it's the resolve and the determination of the people that actually leads to them prevailing. Yeah, General McAuliffe, for example. It looked like he was facing overwhelming odds. The wounded during World War II were saying, Let's give, please don't give up because of our sacrifices. It looked like overwhelming odds as if he was going to lose everything. He was going to lose all of his men. And he listened to the wounded and he came to the Germans with the answer, nuts. And he went and fought him. And he won. There was a group of people who were retreating once in World War II as well. They were running against overwhelming force because uh, the Germans were able to really come in with a lot of armor and firepower. And one guy actually broke column and he went out into a field and started digging a hole. And uh, they thought, well, maybe this guy has had too much combat, you know? Something along those lines. Well, he started digging a hole. Somebody came up to him and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm tired of running. I'm going to fight him. And they prevailed. The world will tell you that your resources make a difference. Your resolve is what makes the difference in every single case. For survival stories, for everything. I've read many survival stories in which people should have died. I like to watch that uh, television show, I Should Have Died, you know. I think that's what it's called. True power is in the resolve. I'll tell you a story about that. There was a fellow, he was out on a glacier, and uh, he fell into the glacier. There was a crevice. And his friend, uh, apparently, the way things worked, had to cut the rope because uh, both of them would have been pulled in or something otherwise. So the guy fell onto a, a shelf of ice and broke his leg. And all he had was the rope, maybe a few uh, things to stick into the ice and things like that. That's all he had. Well, what was he going to do? Here he was with a broken leg on a shelf, he, but he had a piece of rope. Well, he lowered himself down on that piece of rope down to the bottom of the crevice because that was all he could do, but it was something he could do. And then he started to crawl along the ice in the bottom of the crevice. He could hear, though, that the ice was falling underneath him. He could hear that this was not really good ice, that, that it was starting to fall underneath him. He couldn't really feel it fall under him but the stuff below was starting to fall. But he saw that there was a kind of a ramp moving upward, so uh, he went up that ramp, and uh, then 
he found himself in an area with all kinds of crevices. He'd have to crawl around all of them, but he thought, well, I'll start. And he did. And finally, he got to a boulder field, and then he had to splint his leg, and he could only go a little way, and he'd fall over, go a little way, and he'd fall over. But he just kept going on to the next thing, and finally, he made it to camp. The wind was blowing. He fell over into a hole, and he yelled and yelled and yelled, and his friend had actually been in the camp, was still in the camp, and thought that there was a ghost or something in the wind. This is a true story. And, uh, and eventually he came out, and, and there he was. There he was. He should have been dead of hypothermia. He should have been dead of exposure. He should have been exhausted and not able to go any further. What kept him alive? I find this repeatedly was the resolve to move forward. That's what kept him alive. That's what kept him going. That's what made him successful. And that resolve, when you translate that into faith, is an incredibly powerful tool in our society because it transforms people. Now, you may sit in line, for example, at Starbucks. How many of y'all go to Starbucks and stuff like that? Okay, yeah. Yeah, I like them too. And uh, I like their icy stuff, you know. Yeah. There may be a long line. And you may be, <clears throat> for example, uh, in a hurry. And, uh, and you decide, well, you know, I, I've got to get going here. I, you know, and, and this, is, this is really irritating me. Or you can do what some people have done in some of these places, and that is they offered to pay for the person who was at the head of the line. That's called pay it forward. You've heard of that? A very transforming type of thing, you see. A very transforming type of thing. When you have a society where people realize they have a tendency to go in the wrong direction, they have the resolve to go forward because God has promised that you go forward and follow me, and that's the way to go. They move forward with that resolve to love one another and give to one another. Then society starts to transform. You don't have the kind of mentality among the people who believe in that way to shoot police officers, to have violence for violence. You have a different kind of mentality in which you give to others, in which you seek to find peace. Sometimes society just misses the idea that it is sin in the world that causes that kind of thing because we have a tendency to go in exactly the wrong and opposite direction than we should. So you can pay it forward. And I can give you a couple of examples of uh, what happens when that occurs, when we serve others and we realize that we are weak and when we are alone or with a powerful few, but we are strong when we serve one another with the mentality and resolve to serve God. <clears throat> There was a person, actually a couple of people, it was a couple in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan when I was up there, and I'll mention it from time to time because I loved being up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. There was nothing up there, but for some reason I liked it. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, they were a dairy farmer and his wife, and they had two children, and they had this nice little dairy farm. It was kind of nestled into the hillsides and so forth on a peninsula, in Michigan, and things looked really nice and ideal, and one day, tragedy came. A lot of people up there heated with wood, and he and his wife were out in the barn taking care of the cows, and as it turned out, they uh, had gotten the stove a little bit too hot. It was possible sometimes the wood's pretty dry, and it burns pretty hot. And it turns out the boys were alone in the house and the wood next to the stove got a little bit too hot, started to smolder and started to smoke and then started to burn. But not very much. It was just mostly smoldering. And the kids were confused. They didn't know what to do and disoriented because the house was full of smoke. So they went up to the bathroom 
And they put towels underneath the door to try to keep the smoke out, but it didn't work. And so both boys died. Both boys died. Nice, hard-working family. Tragedy struck. Well, what happened after that was quite amazing. And it happens in other places as well, but I'm always amazed by it. After the funeral, some people came over. They said, uh, we're going to build a house for you. And uh, it's not going to cost you anything. Some craftsmen and so forth got together in that, <coughs> in that peninsula. And the wood was already, they were already bringing wood into the yard. They were already bringing wood into the yard. And they just quietly built the house. They didn't make a big thing of it or anything. They just built the house. And later on, that couple adopted a couple of boys. And, uh, and they went on with their lives. But that's the strength that I'm talking about. None of us are very strong alone. Often our resolve flags when we're alone. But when we're together, it makes a big difference. And when we have that mentality of supporting one another, which we have in our faith, it makes a big difference. I had another experience in uh, Mount Pleasant. My car wasn't working, so they brought that flatbed, you know. And they put it up in a flatbed and so forth, and I thought things were going along very routinely, and they were. And all of a sudden, uh, the fellow that was putting it on the flatbed said, Look, uh... You know, I've just had a great experience. And I said, well, what was that? Well, I had a heart attack, and uh, it put me out of commission for a little while. And you know, people came by that I didn't even know and, and helped me and, and took care of things. And I thought, well, there it is again. There it is again. You see, it's moving in that direction. It's the direction that God calls us into. It's that kind of strength that the world doesn't understand because the world has that tendency to go in the wrong direction. We call it back. We call it back and God calls it back to a new and different direction. So when we serve others and we realize that we are weak without that and without the resolve to serve God, that we need God calling us back all the time, then we then things begin to change. Things begin to change in our world. Now the scripture passages talk about that today. They talk about how the people, you know, many, many I've, I've heard very often lately that people are disgusted with the way the world's going. Well, that's what the, the initial passage that we read for today is talking about too. But it also says take care of the people who need to be taken care of change your resolve turn back to god and that's what we do as the people of god we turn back to god we turn back to god we fight that <clears throat> tendency we have to move in the wrong direction <clears throat> and we come into light beautiful light which we love and care about each other, and we don't doubt for one moment that our work here in the church, in this place, is going to go forward. We have that resolve. We don't doubt for one moment that God is going to bless it because of that resolve and that uh, resolution that we have to serve. And let's do that in a joyful way. Don't worry about a thing. Go forward, serve God. And it's that resolve that's going to make the difference. Amen. to St. Paul United Church of Christ, 2030 Plank Road, Keokuk. Join our worship service at 10 a.m. with fellowship hour immediately following. 
Until next week, may God bless.